Firstly, um, sincere gratitude to the organizers of this uh, event and to uh, those who have uh, consented to allow me to breathe the fragrance that we are all experiencing this evening, which is a uh, recollection of what the ulama say, Bidikrihim uh, Tanzilur Rahma, by remembering the great ones, the mercy descends, and we are, as it were, all participating in the uh, blessings and the perfume of uh, uh, Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanvi, uh, whose works continue to give life to the uh, Ummah so many decades after his passing through the curtain into the uh, Akhirah. Uh, I've been asked to, as it were, set the stage to provide the backdrop to the very dramatic story of his life and his uh, accomplishments. and. Uh, to try and pull together some of the strands that created the complex intellectual and spiritual and sharia personality and output of the great uh, Imam. Uh, by way of sketching the broad story of the uh, Ummah in the subcontinent, what were the tendencies that made the man, what were the ideas that shaped his ideas, all of this is important. We do not, as it were, step into a time machine and arrive at the time of the Sahaba and take our Islam directly from them because there is no such time machine. Instead, what we do is we learn from our teachers, who learn from their teachers, who learn from their teachers in an unbroken golden chain of hands stretching back hand to hand to hand, isnad to isnad, ijaza to ijaza, bay'a to bay'a, back to the blessed hand of the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is what we do in Islam, and this is the universal practice of our ulama. So he was a product of his world and one of the extraordinary and I think unique things about the Ummah is that while it is on the one hand the Ummah of Ijaza, of tradition, of Al-Akhdu min al-Rijal, taking from exponents, from expounders, from those who live the way of the Chosen One, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, rather than just reading information in books and trying to imagine how things once were, uh, there is a local fragrance to Islam in the great regions of the Ummah, of all of the great pre-modern civilizations that of Islam spread <coughs> over the largest geographical area. The uh, five uh, large areas as identified by most historians would be first of all the Arab zone, the Middle East and North Africa, which played a significant role in Islam for the first three centuries and then handed over the torch to others. And then there would be the black African zone with the great uh, Muslim intellectual cities, places like Toba, places like Kaulak, places like Timbuktu with great Islamic colleges, madrasas, universities uh, that continue to produce great ulama to this day. And then the zone of the Turks, basically the Anatolian highlands and the Balkans, but also Central Asia as well. Perhaps a fifth of the Ummah, those who speak Turkic languages and their role, really from the high Abbasid period uh, until the present, is quite undeniable. And then uh, in the Far East, Southeast Asia, you have the fourth zone, which is what the Malays call the Nusantara, the Ring of Islands, 10,000 inhabited islands, again full of great ulama, full of great Sufis, people of Erfan, people of Hadith, those who carry the torch of uh, the Sonna to some very remote tropical islands, also part of this great tapestry. And the fifth zone is the Persian zone, and generally the Muslims of the subcontinent are regarded as an extension of that zone, because the culture that developed eventually into the culture of the subcontinent, today came through the mediation of Persian-speaking scholars, not just in the uh, land of Iran itself, but also Central Asia, the great cities of Bukhara and Samarkand, where the ulama were essentially speakers of Farsi. So that's the fifth of these zones. But when we speak about the development of Islamic scholarship in any of these zones, we do find the most extraordinary fact that the curriculum in the madrasas tends to be quite similar. The great works of tafsir, uh, the works of Baidawi in particular, uh, and of others, are common in the madrasas of the classical Islamic world, wherever you might go. 
The basic texts of fiqh will depend on the madhab that are followed. Uh, but essentially they are part of a global Islamic conversation on what is acceptable fiqh, what is an acceptable madhab, and what are acceptable forms of ijtihad. The texts of aqidah, of doctrine, again, pretty standard across the traditional Islamic world, particularly following Fakhruddin Razi and the commentaries on uh, Razi's works that led to the great traditions of Jurjani, Taftazani, Nasafi and others, and the commentaries on those works and the abbreviations of those works which form the backbone of doctrine teaching in the madrasas across the traditional Islamic world, and so on and so on, <coughs> the texts of hadith uh, and uh, Arabic grammar uh, and the works of the ma'aqul, the philosophical intellectual traditions in Islam including sciences such as mantaq and logic Remarkable consistency. And one way in which that took place was that the Muslim world traditionally was a place of travel and also was a place of pilgrimage, that the scholars met each other on the Hajj. And it was possible for somebody to come from Sumatra and one end of the Islamic world, and on the Hajj they would spend weeks and months waiting for the blessed month uh, with scholars from Morocco or from Timbuktu or from Bosnia or from any other place. And that led to a certain globalization, as it were, of Muslim scholarship, which is one explanation for the fact that these basic texts and these basic curricula are uh, not identical, certainly, but certainly part of a single sense of what it is to be Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, despite the enormous size of the traditional ummah and as we'll see and as we'll hear later on this evening the role of Indian scholars going to Mecca and going to Medina developing links with the scholars of those cities and scholars of other places and then returning to India is often one of the forces that are at work in triggering forms of tajdeed and renewal in the various dramatic periods of the history of Islamic scholarship in the subcontinent but specifically the story in the subcontinent is a particularly interesting one because the area is so large and so ancient and so populous and also the area has a religion that seems to be very unlike the Ahl al-Kitab who are the basic form of, of kufr that the early Muslims encountered in uh, Syria, in Palestine, in Egypt, in Spain and elsewhere. Eventually the Hanafi consensus in the subcontinent developed the view that the Hindus and the Buddhists should be considered Ahl al-Dhimma but not Ahl al-Kitab. That is to say, they were to be tolerated and they would pay the jizya uh, and they would have the right to exist but one couldn't, for instance, marry uh, their women. But the story of Islam in the subcontinent, the story of the evolution of its scholarship has as its deeper backdrop the fact that Muslims were persistently a minority and that whereas within three or four centuries of uh, the arrival of the Sahaba in Syria, Egypt and elsewhere, the majority of the population had traded up to the Tawheed of Islam, this didn't happen in most of the subcontinent, with a few localized exceptions in places like Kashmir, in places like Sindh, in some <coughs> parts of central uh, India, in some parts of uh, Hyderabad, Deccan, in parts of Bengal. There were local Muslim majorities, but India as such never converted the way that the Middle East uh, converted, or Central Asia converted, or the Malay world converted. Uh, it simply did not happen. And the ulama were always conscious of this. Now just to take the story of the arrival of Muslim scholarship back to its point of origin in the subcontinent, the early sources are not terribly easy to read, but it does seem that in the aftermath of the conquests of Sindh and parts of Punjab by uh, Muhammad uh, ibn Qasim, madrasas of some kind were established in towns, uh, in places like uh, Debal, places like uh, Thatta, places like Uch, in that part of uh, the um, Indus, Indus Valley and those madrasas we don't know very much about them uh, or whether they had much of an engagement with the local culture rather than being places where um, essentially Arab traders and conquerors would have their children educated but they do become significant later on in the fourth and the fifth centuries of Islam because one of the challenges that the ulama in the subcontinent faced for many centuries was the, the, the struggle with the Ismailis, 
whose da'wah was uh, extremely influential and extremely successful. And one of the roles, it seems, of these early madrasas was the, uh, uh, the, the reaction to, in a kind of Ghazalian way, uh, the Ismaili threat. Once the Turkish-speaking Muslims conquer Delhi and there are Turkic dynasties in, uh, in North India, things start to become much more extensive. Um, so that, uh, for instance, uh, whenever the Turkish sultans conquered a new city, generally one of the very first things that they would do would be to establish not just a Friday mosque, but also a madrasa. So Muhammad Ghori, after his conquest of Ajmer, creates a madrasa in the city of Ajmer, and that's recorded in the historians. Muhammad ibn Tughluq in the mid-14th century, rules for 26 years in Delhi, creates a range of madrasas, and the ulama and the local nobles are doing the same thing. And the historians mention that in his time, in the mid-14th century, there are around about a thousand madrasas in Delhi of various kinds. What we don't have, and this is another way of comparing the tradition of Muslim scholarship in the subcontinent with the tradition elsewhere, is a very ancient institution that continues to this day. Something like Al-Azhar, for instance, um, or Al-Qarawiyin, those uh, institutions that we find further to the uh, West in the Islamic world, they tend not to exist, and the great institutions that exist today in the subcontinent are usually no more than 100 years old, 200 years old, and even something like the Firangi Mahal tradition didn't really originate as a madrasa or an institution as such. Still, yet, still less as a university, but rather the Firangi Mahal tradition when it began was essentially scholars teaching in their houses or in the houses of noblemen in Lucknow and some of the surrounding cities that were connected to, to uh, Lucknow. And that's one of the features that we find recurrently in Muslim scholarship in the subcontinent, teaching in houses. Uh, we tend to think teaching happens in madrasas, it happens in mosques, but very often in the subcontinent some of the most significant scholars are being trained in houses and in the palaces of nobles or in the, the houses of the ulama themselves. So no big, deep, thousand-year, millennial institution like Al-Azhar um, emerges in the subcontinent. The Hanafi tradition is uh, important, and it's worth thinking why the great majority of Muslims in the subcontinent are Hanafi. In the earliest period, it seems there was a variety of madhahib. But following the Mongol invasions and the destruction in 1258 of the, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate in Baghdad, refugees from the Mongols are arriving in India. And these refugees come from Iraq, they come from parts of Iran, but most of them come from Central Asia, from Khorasan, from what's now places like Uzbekistan, southern Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and so forth. And those are ancient Hanafi Maturidi cities. Abu Mansur al-Maturidi is himself from Samarkand. And so they come with the texts that they're able to save from the Mongol invasion. And they settle in India, in these new Muslim principalities. Uh, and they uh, uh, provide the basic, uh, as it were, circuits of what becomes the, the later interpretative tradition of Muslim scholarship in the subcontinent. In the 20th century, not all scholars in India have been happy with this. Because if you look at the classic madrasa curriculum in the subcontinent, you'll find that it's a commentary on top of a commentary, on top of a commentary, on top of an original work of Hanafi fiqh that wasn't actually written in the subcontinent. So something, somebody like Zia al Hassan Farooqi, for instance, who's one of the historians of uh, the scholarship of Islam in the subcontinent, says this was actually a bad thing. And he's looking for explanations. Why is it that the Syrians became Muslims, but most Indians didn't, even though Islam is ancient in the subcontinent? His explanation is that the fiqh of Syria comes from the local scholars and it was evolved in its earliest moment in engagement with the local population with their needs, uh, which was not the case in India. In India, the basic fiqh was evolved in Central Asia and in Iraq and then came into India, and although the commentaries with their ishtihad tradition sought to relate those texts to the realities of living as a minority uh, in a Hindu ocean, still 
the basic logic of the Hanafi fiqh brought um, from Samarkand in, in particular uh, and from Shash, which is now um, Tashkent, was not something that was indigenously il- evolved and therefore, on the view of these scholars, made it harder for Islam really to make uh, inroads because the Sharia seemed to be something from, from elsewhere. That's not necessarily the right view, but it's an opinion that is often found. And certainly it's the case that these basic texts do come from elsewhere. I recently had the uh, good fortune to visit uh, Samarkand and visited uh, the maqam of Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi, which has recently been restored, a very beautiful place. And very, very close is the maqam of Burhan al-Din Marghinani. And you can see that that really is, as it were, the kind of spiritual heart of Islam in the subcontinent. It's not in the subcontinent. Spiritual heart and its scholarly origins are to the north in uh, those uh, distant places. For the much-travelled world of medieval Islam, that was not much of a problem, but it could be if we're looking for an explanation of why it is that India is not now a Muslim-majority country, that that's one kind of explanation. Um, Before the Mughals, and for most of the, the, the Mughal period, there wasn't really a standard or a fixed curriculum. The darsi nizami phenomenon comes a little bit later. And generally, the, each madrasa had its own curriculum. Uh, so in Delhi or Lucknow or Old, one of the great cities uh, where Islam was spreading on the scholarly level, each madrasa would have a different orientation. Some of them would be strongly oriented towards the manqul, others str- strongly oriented towards the ma'qul. And one of the things you could do would be to decide what kind of thing you wanted to study. You'd study in one madrasa for a while, where there was a great professor of tafsir, and then you'd study at another madrasa, where there might be somebody who was very good on teaching the shifa of Ibn Sina, uh, and so on. And very often the scholars move around. Uh, as a result of different madrasas having a different reputation for different kinds of things. With the introduction of the fairly standard Darsin Nizami curriculum from the 17th, 18th century, from the 18th century onwards, uh, that becomes something that's much less common. Um, but generally, in this period, there is a sense that both the manqul and the ma'qul are acceptable forms of Islamic knowledge, and there isn't really a strong argument against the study of philosophy or the study of sort of philosophical kalam in the way that um, happens in some other parts of the Islamic world, for instance, the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century. Um, Uh, It's also important to note that there's uh, a lot of women's education taking place in the subcontinent, and this is often patronized by uh, wealthy women or by uh, princesses. So Babur has the famous daughter Gulbadan, who's herself a great um, poetess um, in Turkish and also in Persian, and she founds madrasas. Selima Sultana, who's the niece of Humayun and becomes one of the wives of the Emperor Akbar, uh, does the same thing. Uh, Jihan Ara, who's the daughter of Shah Jahan, founds madrasas and also writes books um, herself in Persian, particularly biographies of the, of the awliya. So one of the great biographies, or the seerahs, of um, of Khawaj uh, Mu'ayn Chishti is actually by this princess. So there's women as well as men who are in the, pros- uh, in the, uh, in the literary classes. Another thing that may have obstructed the spread of Islam in the subcontinent in this period compared to what's happening further east and further west is a very strong social sort of class system. The scholars tended to differentiate between what they called the Ashraf and the Ajlaf. The Ashraf were people whose ancestors came from Central Asia or from the Middle East, and the Ajlaf were local converts or descendants of local converts. And there are some very strange things that you can find in some of the early fatwas of the ulama in the subcontinent. For instance, um, the Fatawai Jahandari of Ziauddin Barani, which is uh, 13th century in Delhi, quite an early text, he says it's actually haram to give somebody who is of indigenous Indian origin the job of being a qadi or the job of being um, uh, working for the government in any particular way. Those people, even if they become Muslims, have to be kept down. And all that you can teach them is the fard ayn. They have to know how to pray and how to fast, but you don't teach them anything else. It's only these ulama who are, uh, as it were, foreign origin who can be taught those things. And as a result, you can imagine how that acted as a Uh, disincentive for people to convert and created a kind of uh, almost Brahmanical caste system in the subcontinent. The only people who break through this 
and actually managed successfully to um, engage in dawah, and this is why the book that we're celebrating this evening is particularly important, are the, are the Sufis. Because these are the people who are not just in madrasas, speaking in Persian and Arabic, but are learning the local languages and are going out to the local populations in order to bring people to Islam. And somebody like Mu'ayn Chishti would be a classical example of that. Nizam ad-Din Awliya would be another great example. He's a Sayyid, so he's from the, the, the class of the Ashraf. Um, but he was very proud of the fact that he learned his beautiful Tajweed from a slave who'd once been a Hindu. That was relatively strange. The ulama would say it was strange to learn Tajweed from somebody of that background. But it tended to be the Sufis because they were not proud, essentially. They didn't mind at whose feet they sat. For them, everybody who says the Shahada is equal, these are the people who are breaking down the barriers and these are the people who are reaching out, particularly to lower caste Hindus and bringing them into uh, the deen. Uh, the ulama of the highest levels tended to associate very closely with the, the state and regarded themselves as the people who were uh, keeping the state on the straight and narrow. Often the title of the ulama in India, somebody who called himself Muhafiz al Sharia, for instance, or Khadim al Din, trying to keep the sultans uh, to conform to the Sharia, even though the, the sultans often paid no attention. Uh, and there was a kind of relationship between the sultans and the uh, ulama that the sultans would give generous awqaf to the ulama in exchange sometimes for the ulama not being too outspoken in criticizing some of the things that the sultans uh, did. The, but there were some scholars who were exceptions. Historically, in our tradition, one of the responsibilities of the alim is to follow the hadith of the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, khayrul jihad, khayrul jihad i kalimatu haqqin ainda sultanin ja'ir. The best jihad is to speak a word of truth in the presence of a tyrannous sultan. Some of the sultans, some of the ulama, then as now were nervous to do that because they were afraid of the consequences, but um, there were honorable exceptions. So, one example, a certain Qazi Maurice al-Din was famous for preaching in the presence of Sultan uh, Ala ad-Din Khilji for wasting public money, which he was spending on his women folk. The Sultan said, are you not afraid of my sword? To which the Qazi said, I fear only the sword of Allah's judgment. So there are cases such as that, of the ulama representing the people and Allah's law against the sultans. But it didn't always work that way. And that also um, tended to obstruct the spread of Islam amongst the population. Now, when the Mughals come in, uh, particularly when you're looking at the great Mughals of the 16th and the 17th century, uh, there tends to be a greater emphasis on intellectual pursuits, and this becomes a feature of the ulama um, subsequently in the subcontinent. Um, previously, there hadn't been that much attention in the madrasas paid to, um, fi paid to hadith. Uh, generally, there might be a certain attention to the Mishkat, the Masharq al-Anwar, and some Hadith compendia, but it's only in the 17th and the 18th century that the current sort of very distinguished tradition of Hadith scholarship in the subcontinent really becomes uh, very widespread. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the uh, establishment of the Maqulat in the curriculum is partly in order to enable people who aren't even Muslims to come into the madrasa so they can study things like mathematics and science and astronomy and logic so that they also can get jobs in the royal uh, administration. And one of the features of many of the great madrasas uh, in the Mughal period in, in North India is that uh, Hindus and Buddhists as well as Muslims would be studying in those madrasas. One of the controversial, controversial things about the Emperor Akbar is that he said those people don't need to study Quran and Tafsir but they can study Indian things like Vedanta and Sanskrit and this generated a lot of fear amongst the ulama and the sense that the uniqueness of Islam was being watered down. Akbar also brings in somebody who turns out to be really influential in the history of Islamic thought in India, who is from Iran, Mir Fethullah Shirazi. And he's very interested in the philosophy of Ibn Sina and the commentators on Ibn Sina. Uh, and he spreads uh, the, an intellectual approach to uh, uh, Islam throughout the 
uh, madrasas of the empire. And all of this provokes a very important moment in the history of Islamic thought in the subcontinent, uh, which comes about particularly under the emperor Aurangzeb and associated with people such um, as uh, Mujaddidi al Fisani, um, uh, 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 Ahmed Sirhindi. Very pleasing to see that just the other day um, his Maktoubat were, were released in English translation by the American Muslim scholar Arthur Bueller, and it's certainly one of the great classics of Islam. And you can see how the characteristically Indian fusion of things like tasawwuf, al fiqh, and local stories, and Persian poetry and literature are kind of put together in these letters. Um, but the, the point always being that what we need to remember in order to maintain our distance from the pagan or Hindu environment is the importance of the Qur'an and the Hadith. And that's one reason why Hadith becomes so important. People were afraid that they were thinking too much in terms of mathematics and logic and astronomy and that the difference between the Muslims and the Hindus was not being properly maintained and therefore they thought in order to maintain that difference we're going to um, emphasize uh, Hadith. So we find uh, the Firangi Mahal uh, tradition beginning under Aurangzeb, um, uh, Mullah Nizam ad Din, who's from the mid, uh, early mid 18th century, is given a house by uh, the emperor. The Firangi Mahal just means the, ha the palace of the foreigner. Uh, and he was given this and he turns it into a center for learning and it becomes a very major center of, of study. Houses like it are established all over um, northern India and Mullah Nizam ad din is the one uh, to whom we uh, attribute the famous Darsi Nizami curriculum which is actually still very ma'akul oriented. There isn't much hadith there as yet. The 79 major texts that are in the original Darsi Nizami curriculum of which 15 no fewer than 15 are on logic, and only two are actually on hadith. Um, and these are the Mashariq al-Anwar and, and the Mishkat. And two tafsirs, just two tafsirs, the Jalalain and, and Baydawi. Now, we need to ask how it is that hadith starts to take over and the ma'qul and the philosophy and the logic starts to diminish because this becomes a big argument and still is an argument in those who are looking at how to design a curriculum in Muslim madrasas in the subcontinent. Uh, why does that happen? It has something to do first of all with what I've already mentioned which is the emphasis on getting back to the Sunnah of the Chosen One Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to prevent the blurring of the boundary between uh, Muslims and Hindus. But it also has something to do with the fact of Muslim political decline. The Mughal Empire is shrinking, the Marathas are on the march, the British are starting to invade, the Sikhs have their principalities, the Jat. Islam as the Darul Islam is shrinking and as a result there are fewer jobs for people from these intellectual madrasas and people are starting to think about their identity as Muslims rather than just being subjects of the Sultan. Muslimness becomes important because the Hindus are now powerful again and the boundaries between the Ashraf and the Ajlaf become less important because people recognize that they have to, it's absolutely essential that they stick together as Muslims. And the force that unifies them is uh, the Hadith. This is the important explanation, I think, for the uh, recovery of uh, the tradition of hadith. Shah Waliullah Dehlavi is the key figure here. He travels, goes to Mecca and Medina, and uh, comes back with the famous uh, Sihah Sitta, which had hardly been taught uh, in the subcontinent until that time. The later compendia of Tabrizi and others had been more widely followed. But from that time on, with Shah Waliullah Dehlavi, the understanding of the meaning of the Sharia. Why do we follow the Sharia? We're in crisis. The Hindus, the British, they're invading and we need to understand why we're Muslims. What is the purpose of the rulings of the Sharia? And also the need to get back to the Hadith of the Chosen One Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that becomes really important and continues to be a significant figure, feature and different opinions start to emerge. So his famous son Shah Abdul Aziz decides that under the British it's no longer Darul Islam and he thinks that people should make hijrah to Afghanistan. That doesn't work particularly well. The majority of the ulama, including those who end up founding the, the great traditions of Deoband and the Brailvi traditions, Nadwat al-Ulama and others, are people who decide that India is still Darul Islam, 
but we need to maintain the basis of this Dodson Islamic curriculum. But as we move through the 19th century, an ever more uh, increasing emphasis on the hadith and on fiqh, uh, and less and less uh, emphasis on the older things such as insha, Persian literature, Persian poetry, logic, the philosophy of Ibn Sina, and things that didn't seem to be particularly relevant to asserting Muslim identity in the face now of foreign rule, or particularly practical in terms of the urgent need of deriving new fatwas and ijtihad in a situation that was now economically and politically very uh, different. Uh, and then the final factor, which of course takes me outside um, the context um, which I've been asked to speak about, is the rise of Western education. The final issue that the ulama have to deal with is what to do with modern British-style education, with the missionary schools. Should one learn English? Should one not learn English? Um, is it necessary to learn it, to speak in English, to translate texts into English, or is that dangerous? Uh, and that is a debate that continues. But by and large, one would say that the scholars of the subcontinent were quicker than many others in order to move into uh, English. And it's no coincidence that, um, for instance, a great translation of the Qur'an, Allama Yusuf Ali's translation, does come from the subcontinent rather than, say, from Turkey or from Egypt or Morocco. Despite all of the problems, the people of the subcontinent have been quite open to refutations of Christianity, explaining the Qur'an in European languages. There has been an openness that I think has to do with the continued importance of the ma'aqul, the importance of understanding, not just understanding metaphysics, in Ibn Sina's way, but understanding why the Sharia is the way it is. Because unless you have that ta'alil, the interpretation of what the Sharia is for, uh, it's very difficult to explain Islam in an age that's full of questions. Whether rulers are not Muslims, whether are Christian missionaries, whether there are young people with questions, you need to have a tradition that can explain Islam rather than merely telling people what they ought to do. And the scholars of the subcontinent following works like the Hujatullah al Baligha of Shah Waliullah Dehavi have been very good at that. And that really all culminates in the work of the man that we're celebrating this evening. Um, uh, Ashraf Ali Thanvi, who did bring together these brilliant traditions of Islamic intellectuality, of philosophy, of hadith, of tasawwuf, in this very beautiful way, uh, whose success is demonstrated by the fact that so many years after his death, we are launching his books in English translation and people continue to be influenced and shaped by his particular genius in showing the timelessness of Islam and his fidelity to the way of his teachers and to the beautiful and blessed way of the ulama of, of, of Hind and of the subcontinent. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us um, a, good, a, a good opinion of our teachers and to give our teachers a good opinion of us and to make us faithful transmitters of this tradition to the next generation without distorting it, inshallah, so that its blessings as well as its content uh, will live on after we are gone. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.